So we're talking about palmitoylin ethanolamide, or P, and it's used for management in neuropathic pain in animals. So what is this? Well, it's a long chain fatty acid, um, which has some endocabinoid like actions. Uh, I've joined the molecule here and, and uh, this, uh, this black um, represents the carbon molecules of uh, the fatty acid. And this is the more active portion here. And it's a product of normal fatty acid synthesis. Uh, coming from palmitic acid. And you find it in many foods. Uh, the ones that are most commonly quoted are soya beans, egg yolk and peanuts. However, if you're buying it as a nutraceutical, then it would have been manufactured usually through enzymatic synthesis from a fat um, and in particular from palm oil. And that means that if you are purchasing it, then you should be checking what the source of the oil is and make sure that if it is palm oil, that you are obtaining it from a sustainable source. And if you don't know how to do that, then I would recommend this website here, uh, which has an app that you can check the barcode. Now, the problem with pea is it has very poor bioavailability, which means that it's not water soluble, which means that it doesn't get absorbed well from the gut. The forms that are better for absorption are the micronized and the ultra micronized. And so if you are making this as a purchase, then you really should get that source. Otherwise, you're, it's expensive enough, but otherwise you're, you're, you're probably wasting your money. And it may be useful um, uh, in neuropathic pain, but vigorous and unbiased clinical trials are yet to be performed. It's said to have anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antimicrobial and immunomodulatory and neuroprotective effects in rodent models. And in this, it's often given intraperitoneally, which means injected straight into the abdomen to be absorbed. And so although these rodent models are very, very positive, it doesn't mean that it will work in another species that has to get it in through the gut where there is poor bioavailability. So what sort of models has it been used on? Uh, well, ALS, which is motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, ischemic stroke, neuropathic pain and inflammatory and autoimmune disease, uh, disorders. It has a number of targets, for example, example a nuclear receptive uh, agonist, in particular this one called PPAR-alpha, where it has an anti-inflammatory action. The GPR55 receptor agonist, where it's neuroprotective and anti-neuroinflammatory. It has an indirect action on the cabinoid receptors, uh, CB1 and CB2, where it has neuro anti um, uh, uh, anti inflammation in the, uh, in the nervous system or neuroinflammation. And it also has an analgesic properties. And it's also an indirect agonist against the capsian receptor, where it's also anti neuroinflammatory and analgesic. And there have been over 500 papers published on pain. Wow, you think, well, that's a lot of evidence. However, it is mostly rudent models and it's difficult to find papers that don't have a conflict of interest, that is to say, being produced by the people who are manufacturing it. And many of those papers are underpowered uh, and, uh, and uh, the most latest I could find that was a meta-analysis, which means a more uh, uh, stronger analysis, more vigorous analysis, where there wasn't a conflict of interest, had this conclusion that, there, that we really need more adequately powered, so more numbers, better randomised uh, studies, double blind studies and clinical trials need really to um, decide whether or not this is a useful add-on therapy. And it, it should be said that it's an add-on therapy. Nobody's saying that this is going to replace those hard-hitting drugs like gabapentin and pregabalin. However, they did make the comment that it is worth investigating these because it may be that um, this nutraceutical may reduce the amount of uh, of those hard hitting painkillers that you need, minimizing the side effects. And let's face it, you know, uh, if you have neuropathic pain and you're having to take drugs with a sedative or other adverse effects, if you could reduce the dose and have less of that, that's got to be a good thing. 
So what studies are there in veterinary medicine? Well, this cartoon of a tumbleweed is really representing that. There are no clinical studies published as scientific articles. Yeah, yeah, you can find an awful lot uh, of YouTube articles and stuff on the internet. And it bothers me that that is often being pushed by people who are actually selling the drug. And they're using very unscientific parameters uh, for assessing whether something's effective. For example, there was one that said that the dogs had less tears. Well, dogs don't uh, cry for emotional reasons. Uh, there is one study on atopy in dogs, uh, but nothing on pain or neurodegenerative disease. So I would compel you to look at the evidence of this carefully. However, there was a very nice review paper. It does have a conflict of interest. It's been produced by Innovet, uh, which is a supplier for Ultra Micro P. So you have to take uh, that into context that they um, uh, may well be writing this review paper uh, to kind of set up. In fact, they say as a foundation for the scientific and rational use of this. But they also say in their conclusion, quite rightly, that clinical studies in veterinary patients are warranted. And I'm kind of hoping this is the first um, uh, foundation paper and they're going to come up with a, 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 a review paper with a nice double blind uh, powered study um, that I can add to this uh, presentation. If you're looking for dose, um, well, because there's no studies, then the dose uh, is a little bit arbitrary. Um, but the ATP study that I mentioned had um, micro P dosed at 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day. And it has been recommended for osteoarthritis at 24 milligrams per kilogram per day. So watch this space. And I will update it when we get more information.